As tangible indication of an improvement in bilateral ties, South Korea recently joined its UNESCO World Heritage Committee members in granting the green light to listing Japan's Sado gold mine as a heritage site after Tokyo agreed to include in the exhibit its dark history of abuse of forced laborers from Korea. On Issues and Insiders today, we touch upon the progress in diplomatic relations between the two countries. Hello and welcome. It's Monday afternoon, August 5th here in South Korea, and you're watching Issues and Insiders. I'm Min San Hee. Diplomatic ties between Seoul and Tokyo appear to be on track, and today we take a look at the advancements thus far and the tasks ahead. For this, I have Professor Im Min Jung at Kungju National University live on the line. Professor Im, it's been a while. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. I also have Professor Alexis Dudden at the University of Connecticut with us. Professor Dudden, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Professor Im, let's begin with some background information about Japan's Sado gold mine and the reason behind Seoul's initial opposition to its inclusion on UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites. Sure. Um, the Sado gold mine, uh, which is located um, on the Sado Island in Niigata Prefecture, uh, Japan, it has a long um, history uh, dating back to the Edo period. Uh, it was one of the Japan's uh, most productive gold mines and uh, significantly contributed to the uh, its economy. The thing is, um, you know, from a Korean's point of view, um, even though at the in, at the initial stage, uh, the Japan uh, was trying to um, inscribe the, this heritage as the as one of the world uh, UNESCO World Heritage, and they wanted to designate a specific period of time again, which is Edo period. Um, however, you know, any heritages cannot be just divided by the, the specific period of time. And of course, from Korea's point of view, um, it does um, have the uh, painful history, uh, which is related to the forced labor issues. So from our point of view, uh, we couldn't again uh, be happy uh, with uh, Japan's that kind of approach. Again, we um, have been kind of, you know, of course, again, against the, uh, um, the inscription itself. But as you just explained, um, again, the, uh, because of our the new changes in the diplomatic relationship uh, with the Japan, now we are um, trying to um, you know, agree with their um, efforts. But the thing is, of course, we uh, own to negate uh, the, the meaning of, again, the, uh, the history, uh, or um, we are still trying to, again, to encourage, again, to Japan to reflect all aspects of the uh, the heritage. Of course, in, in South Korean society, uh, it's a pretty controversial, especially uh, from more like a nationalistic uh, people's point of view. Again, this is a kind of, again, the compromise, a big step uh, away from the, you know, our historical understandings, those kind of, you know, criticism are, of course, there. Uh, however, again, the, our, our, I, I will also also say again, the, the, our government uh, also should keep making an efforts um, to again to encourage Japan to reflect all the aspects of the uh, um, history uh, in the heritage. Right, indeed, uh, Professor Dudden. Before we delve into the diplomatic implications of this latest development, could you tell us a bit about the significance of the World Heritage Site status and the attempt by countries around the world to secure this UNESCO stamp? of approval, if you will. Sure, um, and Professor Im just set this up beautifully. I'd like to thank her for that. Uh, so UNESCO as an organization began a month after the United Nations, November uh, 1945. World Heritage Sites began in 1972 with the Galapagos being the first. And the, the impetus behind this uh, really has gone on throughout UNESCO's history, which is to emphasize a global and international understanding of the world's most significant educational, uh, scientific, and cultural sites. The idea is to preserve an international humanity, uh, as it were. And as Professor Im sort of underscored, one of the uh, 
problems can le can stem from when nationalism gets in the way. And so here, not at all unique to Korea and Japan relations, these these when tensions arise, they can be really important moments for learning and teaching. Um, here, I personally am looking forward to seeing what the new signs at the Sado gold mine say. We've heard that Japan will uh, have new uh, signs and exhibits, but we haven't really seen what they're going to be. So this is an this is an opportunity for Japan to rise to the occasion of the world community to teach what happened in the 20th century. Um, again, you've got countries Germany, Japan, and China lead the donations to this because it's it's a way for the world to learn the important heritage sites in their countries. Italy, of course, has the most, and that makes sense. Um, but here, I, I personally, and I, I don't mean to shift the conversation, it makes sense to me on the anniversary of Hiroshima, and I say this as an American, it makes absolute sense that Hiroshima is designated as a World Heritage Site. I would put the question out, I think the United States should designate Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project site as a World Heritage Site for that same reason. This is an opportunity to learn global humanity. Right. Uh, in the meantime, Professor Im, would you say that this latest development is perhaps clear indication of Seoul and Tokyo's intentions perhaps to pursue a future-oriented partnership? And if that is the case, Professor Im, what is your assessment of bilateral efforts to that end thus far? Well, um, I uh, don't want to say there is a, a kind of trade of relationship uh, between the history and the future oriented approach. Absolutely, um, I do think South Korea, my country, and Japan, uh, which is the closest neighbor uh, of South Korea, and uh, we do co share uh, many common things like a, a democratic system or even those um, value, liberal value. And we also do share uh, common threats, uh, more specifically speaking, the threat from North. So as long as we do share many things, absolutely, the relationship should be more future oriented, which is, I think, um, needed and uh, required and wanted uh, by majority of the two societies. But that does not necessarily mean that we should just close our eyes over what happened um, in the history, because done is done. Um, you know, I, I do think uh, many Koreans are more than uh, willing to um, forgive um, um, the, what the Japanese did in the past, and um, as long as again the day they admit the uh, the fact, um, but whenever those kind of you know historic so-called historical revisionism arose um, in the Japanese society, which makes us very much frustrated uh, with our neighbor. Again, I recently had a chance to travel to Berlin, and even though I uh, knew that again the Germany they have. Um, uh, they have made many efforts to educate their uh, next generation, but with my own eyes, I saw their exhibitions and the how, you know, the German young people, um, they learn from their exhibition or from the historical sites, which was very impressive. Of course, I do know there are certainly differences between Germany and Japan in many ways. However, still, um, I would like to, and as a whole society, we, again, the South Korean society, want to encourage, again, the Japanese society to just face uh, what did happen in the past. Again, that, that does not necessarily undermine, I think, uh, the potential or the future of um, the more constructive relationship between the two neighbors. Right, Professor, I'm keeping in mind what you just sh shared with us, do you suppose history then will continue to perhaps hinder a progress in diplomatic ties down the road then? Well, certainly our young generations are very different. I actually went to Japan in 1997 um, as a just, you know, high, fresh high school graduate. But back then, the Japanese society was way more 
further developed than the Korean society. But these days, again, our young generation did, don't have any that kind of whatever those complex like, you know, psychology. Uh, they do know, they do like Japanese culture and they do understand uh, the Japanese society and they don't have any, you know, they're kind of, again, more twisted mind. And Japanese vice versa. Japanese, again, the young generation, they love Korean culture. Uh, they want to come and even study in this society. So again, the younger generation, their interests are very different from the uh, more established generation. So I think we definitely um, established the generation should um, should work very hard to create more constructive future for these young people. Right. Professor Dudden, speaking as a uh, scholar looking at this situation from the outside, what do you believe that South Korea looked to gain from its proactive foreign policy with neighboring Japan? So that's an excellent question because um, I don't personally think that a proactive approach to Japan is unique to the Yun administration. In fact, if, if you look at the past almost 15 years, there have been efforts over and over that uh, to engage with Japan that just have been slapped back for one reason or another, uh, largely from the Japanese side to bolster its own pop to bolster a particular administration's own popularity. So I think the Yun administration, in keeping with this line, but perhaps in an even stronger way, is trying to appeal to Washington and say, look, we are equal to Japan. And uh, this is something that uh, he's doing through uh, doing what Washington has asked both Tokyo and Seoul to do, which is to work together to contain the North Korean threat and largely also to participate in its broader uh, strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Um, at the same time, noticeable to me is the UN administration's recent real, um, I would say, scramble to, uh, whether we call it future-oriented or let's bury the past, I'm not quite sure which I would say, um, approach. Uh, this may come back to bite him, and, and I don't mean to sound rude when I say that, but um, I'm not just thinking about the Sado mine, I'm thinking about Dokdo, I'm also thinking about the former victims of militarized sexual slavery, and also, but not limited to history, uh, the decision recently to move past the 2018 radar lock-on and just kick that incident down the road in an effort to kind of say to Washington, look, we're willing to do what you want to do, um, but this, is a, this may be a lot for Koreans to take. Right. And staying with that then, Professor Dunn, what about for, for neighboring Japan? What does it look to gain or how do positive ties between Seoul and Tokyo look to affect uh, Japan? Right. So that's really almost uh, the more difficult question, if I put it that way, because uh, it's the same answer in many respects. Japan is trying to say, look, we're, we are your strongest alliance member. We're going to get along with Korea because that's the policy coming out of Washington to have this triangle, this trilateral triangle. And, um, you know, an equilateral triangle is always a stronger uh, geometrical figure than a sort of lopsided isosceles, if I put it that way, um, because within Japan, these issues are just simply not playing out domestically. Uh, Kishida has never been a very popular prime minister. Uh, and at the moment, his support rate is at around 21 percent. They got elections coming up in uh, September for a new leadership. He's 10 percent of Japanese want him to continue. So getting along with Korea is really not going to help Kishida uh, or even Japan, Japanese understand these issues. Uh, so it's, it's an imbalanced approach. And I think Japan has taken advantage of it. Meanwhile, on the security front, Professor, um, top defense officials from South Korea, the U.S. and Japan recently, and I quote, institutionalized trilateral cooperation. What do you suppose the significance of the security pact and what are its broader implications? Well, as I mentioned earlier, again, the, the threat from the North Korea is now um, very much multidimensional. 
Of course, they have been developing nuclear, and of course, they have been trying to diversify the, the, their missiles. Uh, but in addition to these nuclear and then missile uh, provocations, again, for example, cyber security issues, again, the their, for example, hacking, um, or even they steal some cryptocurrencies, um, which can be used for their uh, weapon developments. So all this kind of uh, criminal-like behavior, um, this is not only uh, against South Korea's national interest or security, but also f uh, which is very much against the uh, Japan, U.S., and not only just Japan, U.S., like more like-minded countries. It can be really undermining uh, the whole system. Again, the cryptocurrency, for example, uh, it will be extended further, uh, whether or not we like it. Again, though, this is a kind of you know natural progress in the human history, human technological history. So as long as, again, the North Korea-like regime keeps stealing somebody else's money, and if they use misuse that those money for uh, for threatening somebody else, I mean, which is an absolutely not good thing. And um, South Korea, of course, we are very much a strong, militarily speaking, very much a strong nation. However, however, definitely we need a uh, more partner countries. Not only Japan, Japan, U.S. These two are fundamentally important. But not only these two, we need more of course, um, even from Europe, for example, even from global South countries, we need more support to uh, effectively deter all these um, threats, real threats uh, from the North. So having said that, I think, uh, um, especially ever since the Washington declaration last year, last April, we did see a witness the Camp David trilateral summit in August, and it has been one year, and we are trying to institutionalize all this cooperation. Of course, uh, in our society, we have allergic reactions. Again, the, how can we have a um, this kind of relationship with the Japan, uh, which is claiming, for example, our territory, Tokyo, as part of their their territory? Their kind of you know criticism are still there. However, um, again, the, we should not, I think, um, mix up all these different issues together and. Uh, I do uh, think, again, that this kind of more multilateral cooperation is very much necessary um, for the more effective deterrence. Right. And, and staying with the subject of security offline and online, Professor Dudden, beyond this particular region, efforts to uh, perhaps lock in defense partnership with the U.S. appear to be quite active ahead of the November presidential election. How do you explain these efforts, Professor Dudden? So um, I really like your expression, lock in. Um, I have had a difficult time in recent months keeping up with how many new alliances uh, my country has. Uh, and at the same time, uh, as you well know, uh, for several several years, this new shift to have an Indo-Pacific strategy has really guided an effort to have all of these new alliance frameworks. Uh, this is a sort of thinly veiled red line of containment around China. Um, I don't think there can be another way of, of thinking about it, whether it is a Cold War reimagination or not. That's really up to how people want to see this line drawn in the ocean. Um, so this even extends, NATO is, is doing this too with the recent announcement of a new, uh, uh, the new, what is it, Korea, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia, Indo-Pacific Alliance. Um, at the same time, there are several aspects of this creation of so many alliances to contain China that stand out to me. One, China is a superpower. It's not a superpower in the future, it is a superpower today, and it will continue to grow. And so to try to have all of these different approaches um, is questionable at best when, yes, on the one hand, and here I think first of economy, um, okay, so yes, foreign direct investment has taken a precipitous drop in China in the first half of the year. At the same time, if you look at Japan and South Korea's exports, China is still number one for South Korea, it's two for Japan, but a close second. So just sort of containing China in this fashion is, is 
precarious at best. Second, security. And you, there was mention of the Middle East earlier in your program. Um, if, you know, really kinetic uh, situation breaks out in the next 24 hours, how do these alliances work? How does the trilateral work in the Middle East when 95% of both South Korea and Japan's oil comes from the region? Do they rush in? Japan is constitutionally barred from overseas commitments such as that. Korea has always participated in American wars. Is this in South Korea's interest? So how do these alliances play out? And I'll wrap up really uh, quickly on this question. There's the Trump factor. And Trump, you you know, yes, he wants to do all of these things about China, which will get him play at home during the election cycle. But he's also threatened to basically cancel all of these alliances. So who knows? Um, it's going to be quite a volatile uh, series of months leading up to the presidential election. And I think the alliances will get a lot of play out of at least the Trumps. Right. And Professor, Abe, keeping in mind Professor Dutton's concerns about the geopolitical tensions that we are currently faced with, South Korea and Japan, they mark, they're poised to mark that as their 60 years of uh, diplomatic relations next year. How should the two governments seek to perhaps direct their bilateral ties against this backdrop of uncertainty with regard to stability uh, globally? Well, Korea-Japan relation is one of the most difficult and uh, complicating and sensitive relationship um, in the South Korea's diplomatic relations with other countries. Um, however, um, I think, as I uh, mentioned earlier, explained earlier, I think we should definitely um, um, focus on and uh, prioritize um, the future generation's interest. Again, the both societies' uh, populations are shrinking. Uh, economies are already mature, uh, industrialized economy, which means our potential for the further growth is pretty limited. Um, um, I'm sorry about my alarm. <laughs> um, but anyhow, um, so as long as we should uh, focus on, um, again, the future generation, the generation's interests, I think uh, the next year's that 60th anniversary um, can be um, um, more a, a better chance for both, again, to, to talk about a uh, more constructive future. I'm terribly sorry about that. No, that's the noise. fine. I think your alarm professor is letting us know that it's the end of the program right now. Right, so we yes. share a lot of common concerns and we need to work together perhaps to better address these concerns. Professor Im, thank you so much for your time thank and your you. thoughts. And Professor Dunn, thank you very much for your insights today. Thank you. Right, well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Issues and Insiders. Thank you for watching. Do join us again same time tomorrow.